Well, all right, we're right at four o'clock. We want to get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is David Pattison. I'm with the Connect OC Coalition. Um, we're going to just go through some housekeeping uh, to start us off, and then I'm actually going to introduce you to your proper host today, Renine and Marissa, who are interns with us at Connect OC. So just to get us started, um, for all of those who are, have been with us before, welcome back. Thank you for joining today. And for those who are your first time, uh, we're really excited to have you with us and to introduce to you all not only the Connect C Coalition and what we're about, but also our fantastic speakers and especially this subject today. Um, so who Connect C is, we are a coalition dedicated to increasing accessibility to mental health services for Orange County transitional age youth, young adults and their families by networking them to local community mental health resources. And you can find out more about us at connect-oc.org. And the Connect OC Coalition is actually funded by the Orange County Healthcare Agency Behavioral Health Services for Prevention and Intervention through the Mental Health Services Act, Prop 63. Um, just as a, a heads up to you all, you know, this is a webinar style event, so we can't properly see you, although you can engage with us via the chat and Q&A functions. If you have any questions, we encourage you to reach out to the Q&A um, uh, function. We hope to be able to get to uh, your questions uh, towards the end of the event. We have some prepared questions uh, for our panelists and we hope to get to yours. If we can't get to your question, we're going to do our best to do that in a follow-up. Um, the event itself is actually being recorded. Again, we can't see you all, so no big worries there, but just so you all know that the event is being recorded. And um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, speaking of the Q&A function, um, some questions that will come through may be of, of more clinical significance, and we're really excited and privileged to have with us today Francesca Cleumis from uh, Casa de la Familia, who, uh, hi Francesca, thanks for joining us. Feel free to jump in and say hi real quick to everybody. Hi, everyone. So she'll be answering any kind of significant, uh, clinically significant questions in the Q&A um, as best as best we can. Of course, um, you know, if anybody has something significant going on, if you realize this, this event, this time that, man, what I have for going on in my personal life or my family's life is, is really significant and not something that I'm going to be able to resolve today through this event, um, we encourage you to, again, to go to connect-soc.org, check out some of the resources there. Um, we may be posting some resources throughout the event. And of course, we also recommend that if anybody uh, at any point feels like they or a loved one or in crisis, we encourage you to call 911. It's one of the best and safest things you can do to make sure that you or that loved one gets the help they need right away. Um, one last thing in terms of housekeeping, we're gonna have a survey at the end of the event. These surveys, I know they're always a little bit of a, um, nobody loves filling out surveys, but they're the way that we know that what we're offering you all is something that's useful and, and it helps us improve for future events. So we really ask uh, that you take the time. It shouldn't be too long, a couple of minutes to fill it out. We're going to provide it to you in a couple of different ways. Um, one, we're going to place it in the chat towards the end of the event. Two, as the event ends, it will actually pop up on your screen as a pop up here through Zoom. And one last thing to sweeten the deal, if you fill out a survey, you'll be entered to win a gift card. Um, so another extra bonus reason to do it besides the goodness of your heart to help us out. So last but not least, I'm excited and privileged to introduce to you all your hosts for today. Renine and Marissa, who are again our interns with Connect OC. Uh, Renine, why don't you start us off, introduce yourself, and we'll let you all take it from there. Hello, everyone. I'm Renine Shahada. I'm an intern with Connect OC, and I'm so excited to be here today and to actually get to know more about prevention of suicide. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Marisa Munoz. Uh, I've been an intern with Connect OC since last fall, and um, I'm also super excited to be here hosting with Renine. Um, so today's conversation about suicide prevention is a super important conversation to have uh, because being able to openly talk about this topic allows us to fight against the stigma. Um, 
that comes with talking about this topic. Being able to have an open and honest conversation on suicide prevention helps everyone feel less isolated. We build connection. And as a suicide attempt survivor myself, we ultimately all play an important role in being able to prevent suicide attempts by even being able to have this conversation um, in this type of format where we are able to educate ourselves and be as honest and open as possible and not feel any shame towards having these questions. So for now, I'm gonna pass it off to Renine to introduce our panelists. Hello, so I would like um, each panelist to introduce a little bit about themselves, their work, and why they are so passionate about prevention of suicide. And we can start with Ali. Hey, thank you for having me. My name is Ali Borowski. I am the founder and CEO of Find Your Anchor. Um, I'm also a graphic designer and moved to Orange County from Chicago, uh, where I lived for 10 years and a rugby player. Uh, but I suicide is very close to my heart. I've survived multiple attempts. And you know, everything that I encountered in the mental health space just felt really corporate and sterile. So I thought I'm gonna create something myself. So Find Your Anchor, a grassroots movement aimed at suicide awareness and prevention with creativity and a personal touch. Thanks for having me here today. Next, Nancy. Hi, uh, and I am very, very pleased to be here today. Thank you so much for asking me. Uh, I am the current chair of the uh, Orange County chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I lost my son, Jeff, to suicide 20 years ago. And it was 10 years after his death that I was introduced to AFSP and I learned about the warning signs and risk factors, warning signs and risk factors that I did not know about. And so I joined up with some people and we formed the chapter in 2014. And it, that was then that I dedicated my life uh, to suicide prevention so close to me because Jeff was 20 years old at the time. And uh, I decided that I don't want to have any mother, any other mothers feel the pain and the sorrow of losing their son to suicide. And as far as that goes and fathers and families and siblings and friends also. Okay. I'm sorry, it wasn't me. <laughs> I was looking at the beautiful building. Um, my name is Rick Mogul. I'm the program director for suicide bereavement at Dee Dee Hirsch Suicide Prevention Center. I'm a lost survivor. My younger brother, Ed, died by suicide 18 years ago. And uh, once I went through the group at Dee Dee Hirsch to, for survivors, I just knew this is something I had to do. And they're going to have to drag me screaming from my desk because I just don't want to leave. I have to continue doing this. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, introducing your, your, yourselves and actually being the change that we all need. And I want to pass this to Marissa to actually get us started with the questions. Yeah, so I'll be getting us started with the first question today, um, which is, what are some common stigmas or misconceptions related to suicide? For example, it's supposed relation to self-harm, that it's simply attention-seeking behavior. Maybe we could talk a bit about that. Well, I've actually heard the comment uh, about a suicide, uh, a, a suicide survivor, a, a temp survivor, and somebody said to me, well, they really didn't mean it because if, the, if they really meant it, they would have killed themselves. And that just goes to show that one of the misconceptions, the stigma around suicide, thinking that a suicide survivor really didn't want to do it after all. So uh, that's one of the very, very unfortunate things that I've heard. And coupled with that is for those of us who are trying to help someone <clears throat> or see somebody struggling, the fear is that if they say, are you thinking of suicide or killing yourself, it's gonna put that thought in their mind. And that's the farthest thing from their mind right now. They're not thinking about killing themselves, they're thinking about ending their pain. And unfortunately, a lot of times that ends in killing themselves. 
And another misconception is that the person is weak. When somebody is at the point of, of ending their life, they are in an extreme distress. They are in a crisis. For them, all other options are just, just un unavailable to them. They don't know what else to do. This is their only way to get out of pain. So it's not a sign of weakness. Uh, it, it's a sign that they are just at, you know, they're at a point that they don't know any other solution to the pain that they're in. I think to piggyback off of what Rick said, because that's one of my biggest things is the asking directly will put the thought in. And, and for me, it was when I was struggling, I, I wasn't at the point where I could string those words along to say it to somebody. But if someone were to ask me directly, it's so much easier to, to nod my head yes or say yes or no and let that in. So to like squash that misconception because that thought had been there. That thought I've been sitting with, I was sitting with that thought for a long time alone. So for someone to verbalize what I've been thinking and holding on my own, I felt like I was seen, I felt heard. And, and in those moments of darkness, that is crucial um, in, in, in those connections. Right, thank you guys so much. I think you guys all touched on really important misconceptions, really and stigmas related to this question. Um, I'll pass it on to Renee now for the next question we have. Okay, so the next question is, what should you do if someone comes up to you and tells you that they're thinking about killing themselves or someone that you know is telling you that they are thinking about killing themselves and wanting to commit suicide? And um, just an experience that I had was that I had a friend and she did tell me that she was feeling these things and she told me not to tell anyone. Um, and but learning in school, we're always taught, you know, if you ever hear these things, you should report them to the counselor or someone. So that's what I did. And eventually she found out that I had, because I'm the only person that knows, so she eventually found out that it was me and she didn't want to be friends with me anymore. And now with that situation that can make someone not want to report or not want their, not to report anything. So what should one do if someone tells them that they're wanting to commit suicide? Just what you did. I applaud you for doing that. The most important thing is to let somebody know because the bottom line is better to have a friend who's mad at you than one who's dead. And you did an incredible yeah. job. Thank That's you. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. as someone who was upset with a friend, you know, that had a friend, you know, share it. Yeah, I was mad at the time. I'm for, you know, I'm grateful for that, you know, now. And it's just like you said, Rick, it's, it's at least there's a friend that's mad at you, you know, then, then carrying that guilt or the, I wish I would have done this, like, you know, again, applause to you. Applause to you. And you know, an, another practical thing you can do if this person is with you, you know, you can say, hey, would you like to make a phone call with me? I have my phone in my hand. <laughs> would you like to make a phone call with me? Let's have a lifeline together. And let's talk to the person on the lifeline because that's a trained counselor that can help that person and, and help you talk with that person and help give that person the resources that they can go to to seek help. You can help them get the mental health services that they would be needing. And so that's the next step that you can take. Say, hey, what can I do to help you? Can I help you get some resources? Can I take you somewhere? Can we talk on the phone together with this person that will help you through this, uh, to get you through this. Thank you so much. And I do have to agree with Ali that it can be like sometimes a burden to know this information and not do anything about it. And to not actually step in, especially when it's someone that you care about. Um, I, have a, I have a short story here for you that I'd like to share. Um, there is a gal that I know that uh, the father of her daughter died by suicide. So the daughter, unfortunately, was familiar with suicide, knew about it, but she was at school. She was 13 years old and she came home from school and said, mommy, my friend is talking funny. Well, the friend was talking about ending her life and not wanting to live anymore. And the mother called me, she says, I don't know what to do. 
Well, we decided that what to do is she called the school and she called the teacher. And thankfully the teacher answered or, or, or listened and the teacher called the parents. The parents were able to get help, you know, said, oh, got help for their child. And I can happily say that about two months at, two months after that incident, there was a posting on Facebook from this little gal. And she said, 13 years old, says I'm alive because somebody cared. So even for somebody, uh, uh, you know, if you know of somebody else who, who is uh, having having uh, difficulties or, or is, is getting to a crisis point, reach out to somebody else who you think that could help. I also feel that it's really important to, mm -hmm. like what you said, to do it together, to call someone together, to be there for them. Because I feel like at that moment, they might be so mad at you, but like, who cares? Like, I wanna help you. Right. I'm gonna pass this to Marissa to, for the next question. Yes, so our next question is going to be, what are some key protective factors that help prevent suicide and related concerns? I think one of the first things is being open to talking about suicide, not hiding behind other euphemisms for it. It, it is suicide, it's death, it's dying. Uh, and being willing to help someone who's struggling. So, and he, being able to talk about your own thoughts, <clears throat> finding a safe person, a safe place. And I think that's biggest part of what we're doing in breaking the stigma is to get people to understand it's okay to talk about suicide. If you don't talk about it, if you hide it, nothing's gonna happen. And we need things to happen, people to step up and help and other people to feel not afraid to say something to friends and family. And, you know, we can also, even before <coughs> a person gets to the level of distress of where they're thinking about suicide, maybe it's the onset of, of some stress or anxiety, particularly among these times. And if we can all uh, promote what we call protective factors around ourselves. And it shouldn't be surprising that those same protective factors that you do for your own physical health, you can do for your mental health. So good sleep habits, uh, good, uh, uh, good nutrition, uh, little exercise, uh, and having a, a, a community support around you, your family, your friends, all of these things are protective factors. So these things that are things that could be used, utilized now, even before it gets to the point where there's a crisis, because we want to treat our mental health just like we treat our, our physical health, right? We want to be proactive about our mental health. Yeah, I, I was going to say something similar, just checking in early and often, not waiting until it gets to be a crisis. Um, I'm always talking about anchors and an anchor being anything that someone can hold on to for another day or another minute. It really doesn't have to be profound or groundbreaking. It can be, you know, steak tacos. It can be a lazy Sunday, you know, pink starbursts, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. And finding these little joys, you know, that, that help you. And so that in those moments of darkness, surrounding yourself um, with, with those little things, to help get you through. And, you know, I mentioned they don't have to be groundbreaking. When I was hospitalized after my last attempt, you know, I was inpatient for 13 days and, and my anchors in those 13 days were an extra pickle with lunch, like a decent pen to write with and a clean pair of underwear, like certainly not profound, but that's what, that's what I look, what got me through and what brought me joy in those moments. So I would say being proactive and knowing kind of what some of your anchors are in, you know, and so that when you're struggling, you can easily access them. Yeah, we should all be encouraging everybody, including ourselves, to reach out. Okay, whenever we're feeling distressed in any way, uh, you know, we just start feeling the anxiety of, of, of things that are going on. Encourage people to reach out. And, you know, and surround yourselves with the positive people in your life. 
uh, can be a great support mechanism. Yeah, I I completely agree with uh, with everything you guys said. You know, um, especially the um, you know the taking care of your your mental health just as much as you would take care of your bodily health with um, eating well, sleeping, everything like that. You know, uh, it's very important to uh, to just be proactive about it every day and not wait until it's a crisis because I think a lot of us wait until the very last minute when we are in tears to start thinking about ways to take care of ourselves. Right. Um, so yeah, it's very important. I'll pass it on to Renee now for our next question. Um, so we're all dealing with something right now in a pandemic. And even though we're all dealing with this together, each person has something that they're dealing with on their own. So how has the pandemic effect, um, had an effect on suicide? and all those related connections. Um, so that we're only one year out, not a full calendar year. And usually the statistics come out after calendar year. And surprisingly, there's a preliminary study that shows that the suicides in 2020 were less than 2019. And 2019 was even less than 2018. So there's something happening. I, we know that you know if somebody who's marginalized, somebody who's already isolating themselves because of a mental illness, because of the thoughts of suicide, to have to stay in a small space, regardless of where you live, that small space is here, and physically a small space. They're isolating. They're isolating from themselves. They're isolating from humanity, from being held and touched. It, it's a huge... I wish I could find a good word for it. I don't want to say anything nasty, but it it causes so much stress, and that thoughts of suicide are being are becoming more prevalent. Our calls are going up, but not according to this preliminary study, not necessarily the suicides themselves. So something's being done correctly, at least how I see it. And you're absolutely right, Rick. The statistics that we had, the uh, suicide rates from 2019 to 2020 uh, went down 5.6%. Uh, We're not sure why. Uh, we, we are hoping that it's because of the, um, the mental health uh, aware, more awareness and the measures that we've all taken uh, has had a positive impact on our population. Um, having those open and honest conversations, not only within the community, but within the individuals and implementing uh, good safe practices and seeking help early. All of these we hope are, you know, are the contributing factors for the lowering of the suicide rates. But unfortunately, you know, we're not going to know, uh, we're not gonna understand the entire impact uh, of COVID-19 to the suicide deaths for another year or longer, because it takes time for those statistics for the CDC and for the other entities to put those um, uh, that, that data together. We do know that the pandemic has um, affected different populations differently. We know that there's been disparities, okay? So we're hoping that um, it, it will take us time to look at those and to see and to see what it is that, uh, that's been happening. And we also know that we have a, a inkling feeling, if you will. Uh, I heard it on another webinar, somebody related to PTSD, that when everything is over with and everybody starts try, trying to get back to normalcy, there might be some real PTSD among the kids. And so we might have, you know, more things happening when this whole thing is over with. So that's another thing that we're going to, to look at and we want to make sure that we're prepared for so that we can help uh, everybody that's, that will be in crisis or if they are in crisis or if they're having any type of a level of, uh, of distress. Yeah, I think COVID has really exacerbated a lot of things. And I always talk about this like epidemic of hopelessness and this lack of connection that was already, you know, an issue before all of this. Um, and, you know, 
I feel like if, if anything positive has come from this besides, you know, those videos of Italy singing on their balcony, um, it's that it's equipped people with kind of a, a, a foundation that maybe they wouldn't have before in mental health. Now, you know, everyone's gotten a taste of anxiety in, am I gonna get some toilet paper? Is, is there gonna be enough food on the shelves? Like, so while it's certainly not the same, now people that may have never been versed in mental health now have a little taste of it. So now maybe that's a foundation that we can all work from. You know, before you couldn't plead ignorance because now, now you, you've got an idea. Um, so I feel like that's somewhere and something that we can work from. I think that's very valid. Allie, that's very, very important because, you know, a lot of people are talking about mental health who never even thought about it before. And even though the people that have gone into the COVID, uh, I'll say fine, you know, they're going into it healthy. They started having maybe a little bit of anxiety or those people that, that seem to be doing well, they're talking about it and they're becoming aware of the friends and the families around them. So uh, mental health is uh, at the forefront of our discussions and uh, we hope to get even more education out there about it. And every conversation helps. This is, gotcha. you know, it just helps normalize it and it's okay. So mm -hmm. We're talking about it, we're okay. Thank you all so much. Um, those are all such good points and insightful. You have to agree that I've seen it myself, like the mountain of anxiety that has risen with everything that's going on. And more people I notice are like making sure that their mental health is okay, making sure that everyone else around them, like their mental health is okay. And I feel like that is something that is actually good that I've seen happen. I wanna pass this to Marissa. Oh, or Rick. Do you wanna say something, Rick? Oh, no. I'm stretching. <laughs> I wouldn't be afraid to say anything. <laughs> okay, so for our next question, it's going to be what behaviors are warning signs for suicide, which is, I think, really important to talk about in case um, anyone um, hasn't thought about that. Well, one of the warning signs is that, you know, some people actually, actually say, uh, you know, they start talking about it and, we, and they can talk it directly, indirectly, they could joke about it, um, but always take it seriously, you know, and other warning signs is they start giving away their possessions and this can be in the form of giving away their money. Uh, it brought, as uh, brought to my attention just the other day that uh, people who are thinking about suicide start giving away their pets. So we're reaching out to veterinarians and say, hey, if you start having, you know, your clients, customers come in and somebody who, you know, has been bringing their dog to you for a long time and seems to be very attached to their dog and all of a sudden they don't want their dog, you might want to find out, you know, what's happening. Uh, that's something that never occurred to me before, but even giving away your pet can be a sign that you're thinking about suicide. In isolation, at not uh, engaging in the activities that you like the best. And I know for some kids, you know, that's been really hard during this time for the, let's say the little soccer players, you know, they haven't been able to get out and do that. So, you know, it's, it's been very, very difficult for them, but um, engaging in activities that they like to do could be a sign. There's also, there's quite a few things that come under um, uh, behavioral issues. And really, the things to look for, and if it's somebody you know, somebody that loved one, a friend, a co-worker, a fellow student, changes in their behavior. They used to be a certain way, fun, going out, doing whatever things we all do together, or they all do together, and all of a sudden they're pulling back. They're not doing it as much. A, a drop in grades, someone who's been a high uh, achieving student is all of a sudden getting C's and D's or B's and C's. It can be a small change, but recognizing that that change could mean something is going on and we, ha we have to ask the questions. You know, 
you were doing so well and all of a sudden this is happening. What, what's going on? What caused this to happen? What are you going through? Because <clears throat> we can talk about eating too much, not eating enough. So it doesn't matter which way it is. It's still a change. Sleeping too much, not sleeping enough. Behaving recklessly. Um, just there's so many things that if we notice the way a person is because they're close to us and we'll know and all of a sudden they're not being that way anymore, it's incumbent on us to say, what's going on? Why aren't you coming out with us? Why aren't you doing this anymore? And we used to follow you there. Now you're not going. They need somebody to make that, that connection to them and reflect back to them the things that you've seen, let alone just heard. So very yeah. important to watch for that. And, you know, any, like, like Rick says, any, anything that you see that you're noticing is, is, is just not right. And sometimes it's a gut feeling. It's an instinct. That's when you should reach out. And, you know, sometimes that reaching out, suicide not, might be on that individual person's mind. But you know what? Just by listening to them, you're showing that you care and you are taking the time to listen. And which is very, very important. Yeah, I think Nancy and Rick hit the nail on the head here with all of the signs. I would also caution against the, or, you know, look out for the, the blank, I'm fine. You know, the, the kind of empty eye, you know, no real response. Like I hid behind the blank, I'm fine. So I encourage, you know, your people better than, you know, you know, any of us, that gut feeling of something's off and just maybe reading between the lines a little bit because you, there's a lot of hiding behind the blank, I'm fine. And, you know, and part of that is knowing, let's say, you know, uh, that somebody who uh, is, is struggling in school or, you know, has been very unhappy about not being able to be involved in the sport that they're in. And then they, you see them acting out in, the different, in, in a specific way, in a different way than you're expecting them to. That's like connecting the dots. That's like, ooh, this has been happening. And now he's acting like this. There can be something significant going on. So uh, it's not only, it's, it's knowing a little bit of their, uh, their history, if you will, and then it's knowing what you're seeing now, the observable signs. Yeah, thank you so much. Like um, Ali said, I think you guys definitely hit the nail on the head with all of those. Uh, I remember when I was going through my hard time, it was going from an A student to an F student and showing up to school every day with, you know, just feeling like that blank stare of I'm fine. And, you know, it, it, the signs are different for everyone, but it really helped me when someone would be like, hey, you know, like you used to come to school, you know, not in baggy hoodie and sweatpants and you would actually show up to class. So I think it's important that someone was asking me those questions for sure. Um, and now we'll hand it off to Renine for the next question. Um, so what can be done to actually help prevent a mental health challenge from becoming a suicidal crisis? We go back to talking. It's so important. If you're going through, if you're struggling, the best thing is to talk to a therapist. And if, and here's the other issue. Sometimes people are struggling. They don't want to tell their therapist. They don't want their therapist to feel like they're not doing a good job. But this is your life. This is your body. This is your time. And how are you going to protect that? We can't do it alone. And that's why talk therapy is so important. And if that's hard, talk to a family member, somebody you trust. And here we go with, again with finding a safe place to talk about what you're feeling and what's going on. And when you are talking to your therapist and you're getting medication, if there's something different about your medication or you don't feel like you're getting the right, uh, what you're looking for out of it, you need to talk to the psychiatrist and make changes. Let them make changes based on your input. 
they don't they shouldn't just go boop hey this is going to help you <clears throat> let them know what has helped you so it and it, it everybody else around you has to be an advocate for you as well because sometimes you just don't have the energy to do any of this you know it's just uh, maybe tomorrow you know and tomorrow comes and it's even worse what are you going to do and take and having self-care strategies sometimes it's just uh, a stepping away and either it's a meditation or a journal or it's listening to music okay or going outside walking around the block getting some fresh air uh, it's, uh, uh, anything that will you know that you can step away and be with yourself and and breathe and uh and and try to get to that to a calm place calm place to help you through that moment of anxiety so if you can find some self-care strategies uh that can help you out that will help also yeah and i go back to you know talking early and often and i'm a huge proponent of a pain shared is a pain halved so you know talking through it with someone letting letting them in you know i was always sure I knew what the person was going to say or how they were going to react if I talked. Let them surprise you. I had no idea. I'm not a mind reader, you know, and, and by putting up those walls, I wasn't allowing them in and letting them prove me wrong. And, and I think you'd be surprised once you start letting people in. And you have another place that you can talk freely, and that's to the crisis line. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're there. There's someone to talk to. And it's anonymous. I mean, you know, if you're afraid of telling your family or your friends and facing people, do it on the phone. That's what they're trained to do. And Dee Dee Hirsch is a part of that. We do take calls from the crisis line. We're actually, Dee Dee Hirsch is the official crisis line basically, even though it's national uh, for Orange County. Mm -hmm. That's part of our, uh, what we do in Orange County, part of our contract. And we have a text line also, I believe it's 761761 and text the word talk to the crisis text line. That's also open 24 seven. Correct. I have to agree with Nancy when she's talking about doing self care that's like the number one thing that helps me and I know helps many others, whether it's like writing in a journal, taking care of yourself, doing skincare routines, having a routine and taking care of yourself helps so much. Listen to music, mm -hmm. dance in front of the mirror, mm -hmm. sing in the shower, do any, do anything that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear me singing in the shower. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to hear me either. Um, that's why I sing in the shower because you can't hear me. Yeah. Um, but um, all, all those things, is sitting down to play play an instrument for a little bit, or um, you know, uh, or picking up a book that you've been meaning to read for a while, and and just you know, all those things that you would that can help you to just feel that you're doing it for yourself, which is very important. And Raineen, I wanted to ask you something. Mm -hmm. So you journal, correct? So have you read it back to yourself, what you journal? Sometimes, but I do wait, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 I don't want to face that pain again right away. Mm -hmm. But have you ever read it out loud to yourself? No. It's different. I'll when you're writing it, it's going directly mind, hand, paper. When you hear your voice talk about what's going on, reading from your page, it has a different aspect. Give, I'll, I give that a chance. Thank you, I'll try that. I'm gonna pass it to Marissa for the next question. Yeah, um, actually the panelists were already kind of segueing into this next question in the previous uh, question. So what are some resources that counselors or administration might utilize to help youth who are struggling with suicidal ideation or suicidal um, tendencies that they are seeing? Right away, 
refer to the student counseling center. That's mm -hmm. why it's there. Uh, if it's high school, middle school, of course, going to uh, getting an appointment with the school psychologist or therapist or even the nurse, someone to talk to. Um, and as as people trying to help, you can offer to take people to to the center. You know, if they, they're afraid to go in alone. Um, and we we offer suicide prevention training on campuses. Uh, most of uh, Southern California, uh, California State Universities, UCLA, USC, Irvine, Fullerton, we're all over trying to train people on campus to recognize the warning signs and to be able to do something for their friend, their family member, or their fellow student. Yeah, we at Find Your Anchor partner a lot with a lot of um, counselors and schools uh, to partner and get some of our Find Your Anchor boxes onto campus. And there are little blue boxes that we launch throughout, you know, all, all over campus. And, you know, inside there's a deck of cards, 52 plus reasons to live, an infographic on depression, a letter posters, you know, list of resources, bracelets, sticker, a whole bunch of other good vibes and people can add to it and launch them throughout. And we've been doing a lot of workshops in box building and, you know, a lot of schools get really creative in doing like scavenger hunts um, and boxes throughout to different like touchstones throughout the community. Um, and just taking a different approach to mental health, something, uh, dare I say fun or just a little more hands-on, something tangible, something real to hold in your hands. So we love we love partnering with schools and counselors. Yeah, uh, we regularly um, refer people to the Didi Hirsch uh, because they have a just so many uh, classes and resources for parents, families, kids. Uh, they have a, a lot. So we do a lot of referrals to, to Didi Hirsch. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, those are important um, resources and um, ways for uh, counselors uh, to go ahead and get help for the kids. So I'm going to pass it on to Renee now. Um, so for the next question, it's going to be talking about from the parental point of view. So as a parent, what are the best things to do when your child tells you that they're wanting to commit suicide and that they and they the child tells the parent that they've already attempted once and now what should the parent do uh, in case that they the child might attempt to do another time i i'm not pushing therapy because i'm not a therapist <laughs> i utilize them but really getting your child in to be assessed if they need medication, it's it's no dishonor to have medication to help level out moods or help you get through the day. Um, and you know, young young kids as young as four and five, any, any of the therapists will tell you our talk. I've talked about wanting to not be here, wanting to die. Um, it people have to do something to to save their children. If it was a burning house, you'd run in there and grab your child and run away, get some water, whatever. This is a burning house right here. And you need to do something about it. And don't be afraid of saying the words. Not to your, it depends on the age of your child. There's, you know, word appropriate things that you can say, but just be there for them. Let them know, don't, don't get panicky. Just be calm and let them know that you're going to get them the help they need. And looking back on it, I think I would have uh, worked with a, a found a mental health professional um, and, and gotten uh, and made, and have both of us go, uh, go together maybe, or uh, I, 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 my, my reaction as a mother was, is to seek out a, a professional. Now, also uh, 
for those that are in faith communities, sometimes the faith communities can help, okay? Uh, because the faith communities help give a purpose in life. And with the faith communities, you also have a community, a community of the people that, that you know, can surround that person. But uh, for, a, for a mother, I would say, uh, and I'm speaking as a mother here, is to seek mental health services. <clears throat> and, uh, and there's lots in Orange County. And I know that for some, <clears throat> there might be a uh, financial barrier, but uh, I seem to see in the chat room, somebody put something in there about, um, about uh, uh, helping with, with uh, uh, counseling services uh, that would help with uh, uh, low cost, if you will. Yeah, I'm not a parent, but you know, as someone that struggled and had parents, I just, I would say loving, loving your child through it. Um, instead of trying to figure out the whys and trying to apply logic where sometimes logic does not live. And, and, you know, when I was struggling, I didn't even know why I was struggling. I couldn't make sense of it either. So to try and have to explain why I'm feeling this way and, and, or be faced with like frustration, like just the unconditional love and support is invaluable um, in those moments uh, to a child struggling and, and knowing that it's a safe space um, and, and someplace that, you know, I can come and talk to you about just creating that and being there. And the other thing is that when we're talking, you know, we, first of all, we don't want to try to fix it. As parents, we want to fix it, right? I think you should do this and I think you should do that. And you know, these are the steps you should take. Listen to them, okay? Because what they need to be is heard. And then have the mental health professional or, this, or you know, the community around you help give support to that person, remind that person of their strengths, remind the person of the gifts that they have by being here with us uh, and of the talents that they have. And, uh, and don't, no judgment, uh, we give no judgments, you know, well, you know, some people will say, well, that's weak, or you're being selfish. Those are judgments. And that's not the case. So we want to make sure that we stay away from the judgment, we stay away with trying to fix it. And if we can't understand it, that's kind of natural, because some of us have never been through that, we don't know what it's like. So all we can do is love them and help them to get the services that they need, the mental health services that they need. Thank you for that. And I really do think that it is so important to love the child through whatever they're going to, whatever they're going through, because they're gonna take that with them throughout it all. They're gonna take that, that one time that they are loved through their whole entire life. And I feel like that is such an important thing. And also try not to fix them as like, try not to fix them, but also to get help them get the help that they need. I'm gonna pass it to Marissa. Yes, so the question, the next question is, um, well, as a suicide attempt survivor myself and with uh, having conversations with other survivors and other, um, people that have had a suicidal ideation, um, I have noticed that a lot of people tend to center themselves as a reason for you not to try it again, like attempting to guilt the survivor, um, kind of like, did you not even think about how that would affect me and other comments along those lines. Um, so how do we deal with this when it feels like no one understands? Get a megaphone yeah. and put it against their ear and yell it out. They won't hear you because it's all about them. Uh, yeah. I, I'm getting, that's a rant. Okay, I got my rants. I, I am only just do one today. The, and that's the problem. It, 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 the one thing we won't do on the crisis line is guilt somebody into not killing themselves. It doesn't work. You can't we can guilt them. Point out their strengths. Point, we can point out their talents, their strengths. And, and why it's so wonderful to have them in our lives, okay? 
uh, and and let them know that. But the guilt should not be there. No, it shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about them in those moments. That's not where my focus was. That was not. I'm trying. You know, I was trying to get through just each moment. I wasn't worried about what my aunt was thinking. You know what I mean? Like it's. It, it's not about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And it can be kind of difficult to already be in a situation where you feel alone and then have just more of that feeling come through when all you're getting is trying, then they think that they're trying to help you, but it's really not helping, you know? So it is, it is a difficult situation to be in. And now I believe we are passing it off to David to, uh, continue on. Yeah, well, thank you all. Um, so my task here was to uh, pass on to our panelists any questions left over from uh, the audience, the attendees. Um, uh, Francesca's gotten to a lot of them and I, and I think offered some really important responses. There's still a couple of things I'd love to have the perspective on the panelists um, to, for you all to speak into. And of course, for our audience, if there's any other questions, Go ahead and pop them in. We'll do our best in the next, we've got about nine minutes left to get to them. But um, for the time being, there was a really great point made in the chat that I'd love to hear you, everyone's perspective on. Uh, one of the questions we read earlier used the term commit suicide. And the use of language is important. The, the, the attendee highlighted that. And there's been an important shift in language from things like commit suicide to uh, completed suicide, died by suicide, those kinds of things. And that, a lot of that relates to stigma. Can you comment on why language in this, in this way is so important? It's, it's very important. And it's in, uh, because in, in our society, when we use the word commit, it usually refers to a crime. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as a lost survivor, all righty, I don't want to hear that my son committed a crime. Okay, he died by suicide. And we can say, I can say it out loud, right? He killed himself. He ended his own life. And the other two words that we want to stay away from is failed and, and successful. A successful suicide isn't what we want. That, those are judgment words, right? We don't use judgment words. So it's the same thing. They, they kill themselves. Uh, they died by suicide. And uh, we encourage you to stay a word, stay away from the words commit or committed, failed, and successful when uh, referring to a suicide attempt. Or completed. Completed, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there was another topic that was brought up in the chat that I would like to talk about because Many of us, when we are experiencing depression or anxiety, we do want to talk to someone who we trust, which is mostly our general practi general practitioners. You know, we want to go to them first and they always offer medication. So most of the time, what we do at CASA and other, you know, therapy places, we do want to get to the talking part first. Talking about it is the most important thing to do Sometimes it's just an, an ideation, which is just a thought. You know, sometimes we don't, we don't want it to get past that. We don't want it to go into a plan or a set date that they want to do this. That's why we always try to want to prevent it. And so always just reaching out. You know, there are places like Gaza that are low cost or even some places are even free services just for talking. So, you know, I also want to bring that up as well because I know someone mentioned that in the Q and A. Yeah, it's 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 been the standard that the uh, PCs, primary care physicians, are the ones that are uh, prescribing most of the antidepressants. And uh, they can help. They can be a part of somebody's continued care by ruling out any kind of physical things that are possibly causing a person to feel that way. But it's the talk therapy, like you said, has to come first. Psychiatrists don't have a lot of time. I, I know that, but still they're the people who can monitor 
the effects and the efficacy of the medication they're giving them. Um, and I, I don't know, is it, you know, medication is a crapshoot right now. There's no blood test to tell you, okay, if you take this particular two pills this way, you're going to take care of your depression. It, it's combinations, it's dosages, it's trying things all the time until you find what actually works for the person. It's personalized. Um, and it's not a quick fix. You're not going to take the medication and feel, oh, look, I took the pill. I'm fine. Great. Thank you. Bye. It takes a while for your body to absorb and produce the things you need in your body to feel the depression reside. Subside. And I would say too, there's no like, there's no one size fits all solution no. to mental health or the struggle. You know, what works for you may not work for me. So, you know, trying different things and and getting creative with with it. And I always say like, add it to your tool belt. Like you have a whole toolkit of, of things and access, you know, what you need when you need it. Um, so I think relying on one particular thing isn't, isn't particularly helpful. And it, and it, and it takes, I feel like a whole bunch of things and figuring out what works best for you. And one other thing, we also have groups for people who have attempted suicide. So being in a room with other people who have similar experiences, it's individualized, but it's still about wanting to end their pain. And we have that, um, we've been doing this now in LA since 2010 and uh, down in Orange County for quite a while as well. So it's a chance to be with other survivors. And the groups are all led by a therapist and a peer support person, someone who has lived experience. And if I remember, I. I think Joanne sent you the information on what we do. Yeah, okay. So there's cards and things that are gonna be available um, at the uh, website that they had posted earlier. Well, um, you know, thank you um, to all of our panelists. I wanna do a couple of things here. We're running right up against the five o'clock hour. We initially mentioned that we we're gonna to stick to five o'clock. Um, for our panelists, if you're willing uh, to hang out for a few more minutes, you might get to a couple more questions. Um, and then, I, but, but, but for those who have to go, we totally understand, we said five o'clock. Um, but I do want to just mention a couple of house, uh, housekeeping wrap up kind of things. As a reminder, we have that survey. We'd love to get your perspective on what you thought of the event. Again, we'll also, into, also enter you for the possibility of bringing a gift card. Um, we have a couple of other things coming up. If you want to know about more uh, of these kinds of events, I encourage you to go to connect-oc.org and there in the event section, you can find out more about events coming up, including a follow-up event we have coming up just next week. We're doing an Instagram live with Ali uh, from Find Your Anchor, where we're going to get into the, the meat of what's in a Find Your Anchor box. How do they work? What's the, the, the value of this kind of a thing, this kind of an intervention? And actually we're going to be um, getting some Find Your Anchor boxes out into the community. And we'll be talking a little bit about how to access those via Instagram. So you can follow us at Instagram, um, connect underscore OC. Um, I'll ask one of you, one of my colleagues, if they get the opportunity to place that in the chat. Uh, one other thing I just want to comment on some of the stuff we're talking about, you know, to our panelists points, there are a wide range of tools and options and therapies and interventions available for folks who are struggling uh, with their mental health. Um, and so I would encourage you all to explore those. We have a bunch of resources on connectoc.org. I want to mention one in particular that I think is a great place to start if you're, you know, you're just trying to figure out what's happening with me or what's happening with my loved one and where do I go from here. I'd recommend you go visit namioc.org. NAMI, the uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness, offers a fantastic range of classes that do just that. They help folks who are struggling gain a better sense of what's happening for them and how to walk the path of recovery, as well as classes for families to do the very same collaboratively. Something Nancy touched on earlier is how important community is in all of this. Um, as we wrap up, I want to ask um, for each of our panelists, um, and, and thinking, especially of Nancy and Rick, in, in this case, and Ellie, I have a question for you as well, but Nancy and Rick, 
um, for everybody there who's out there who's watching, um, Nancy, as you can see in her background, there's a little uh, quote that says, talk saves lives. And in fact, talk does save lives, but that's also a fantastic training that the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and specifically Nancy, I've gotten to, to attend a couple of the ones she's offered before, um, offer for everyone to just how to begin this conversation with a loved one, with a, a friend or family member who's struggling. Um, Nancy, how can they get a hold of you and see about scheduling or participating? Well, I tell you what, I'm as we speak, as I'm speaking, I'm putting my email address into the chat. Great. Anybody can contact me at any time. And what Talk Saves Lives is, is a uh, community-based presentation about the risk factors and warning signs about suicide and what we can all do to help prevent it. It is meant for the population of 18 or older. Okay, I really encourage parents, particularly, uh, to to, uh, to to watch the presentation, and uh, I'm also going to put a website link in there where you can look at when I'm. As a matter of fact, I'm giving one uh, this Thursday night that is open to the public, so um, I, I'll put that information into the chat also. Great, and if you provide that information, as Nancy, maybe we can get that out through. We'll be sending out a follow up email yeah. after this event. And then Rick, as it also turns out, I've attended a few of these, Dee Dee Hirsch offers fantastic trainings for all different levels of the community about how to um, uh, intervene when someone's struggling uh, in, in the way we've been talking about. Um, so Rick, what, what's the best way to get connected with Dee Dee Hirsch and to see about participating in or scheduling one of those trainings? Actually, I was just gonna put the phone number for our outreach and training coordinators, uh, which I'll put into the chat. Um, and they schedule and perform most of the trainings. Um, the therapists in the office will do the clinical trainings. Um, I do the clinical. In fact, I just did one for OCDE before I came here. Um, and we also do, uh, we go to health fairs. We take, we'll put our, our flyers and our brochures out on all the services we have and about suicide and about how to help somebody. So it's, it's um, there's a lot available. Um, uh, AFSP has a ton of brochures that are about, in fact, we use one of theirs for survivors after a suicide loss. We put it in all our packets. I mean, we're brothers and sisters really is when- you know, We are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we support each other. We go to their walks, they come to ours and have a table. So it's a community. It's a community trying to help others with lived experience and who are survivors of a suicide loss. I'm gonna to try to get those numbers in here pretty quick. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. And, and also if any of we, I know we've put a lot of information in the chat. We've mentioned a number of resources. If you miss anything and you're, you really wanna get a hold of it, one, a lot of it is on our ConnectOC website, but also um, you can email us info at connect-oc.org. And if there's something that, that you missed, you, you would say, how do I connect with Nancy or how do I connect with Rick or Allie? Um, email us and we'll, we'll help you get connected. And on that note, Ali, how do folks find out more about Find Your Anchor, about Find Your Anchor Boxes and connect with you and what you all are doing? Yeah, I just dropped some info in the chat, but you can go to findyouranchor.us and on the website, you can request a box uh, for yourself if you're personally struggling. You can get a box and be a, become a messenger if you know of a friend or family member struggling and you know we can send it directly to them or we can send it to you and you can pass it along. And we're always open for partnerships. We love partnering uh, with different schools, organizations. Um, they help support and we call them our buoys that help keep us afloat and help support all of the individual box requests. So we do workshops, box building, uh, just really at the end of the day, just trying to put more love into the world. So all about it. Ali, thank you. Nancy, Rick, thank you. Uh, Marissa and Renine, thank you. Um, excellent job. Um, and to everyone who's attended, thank you. You know, this is, this is a beginning kind of conversation. We're just talking about some of the basic stuff. Hopefully a lot of these resources we provided can be next steps for you all to either get more involved in this kind of uh, work, um, this kind of effort to be better informed, to better inform your community and, um, and to help folks who are in need get the support they need. Um, our loved ones, our friends and family, and our broader community. Um, I, I also want to mention to you all, 
speaking of if you've missed anything as we're going through this, this training, or you want to see this again, or, or excuse me, this panel, or you want to see this again, or you want to share this with someone, uh, this recording, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording, will be available on our website shortly within the next day or two. And when it is available, for those of you who are registered, we'll send you out an email letting you know, hey, it's up. You can check it out and you can share it um, with your friends and family. Um, I don't know if there's anything, I think I'm, that covers about all of it. I don't know if there's anything I'm missing, any final words from everyone, anyone? I want to thank everybody that was here today. Thank you very much for the invite. I've learned a lot today and listening to everybody. And uh, we hope that my biggest hope, my biggest hope right now is that everybody is taking care of yourself. Use all the self-care strategies that you can to keep your mental health healthy. And uh, so that uh, just to help yourself and you can help others by doing the same. What Nancy said. Yeah. <laughs> what Allie and Nancy said. Yeah. <laughs> I actually feel honored thank to have been us. selected to do this. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one last thing my uh, colleague Blair rightly reminded me. So I mentioned earlier that we have this event next week, uh, this Instagram live with Allie. Um, about Find Your Anchor and looking through a Find Your Anchor box. And we mentioned there'll be some ways for you to get a hold of one. If there they are right there. Um, if you want to take a more direct route to get a hold of getting a hold of one, in addition to reaching out to Ali, as we mentioned, and visiting findyouranchor.us or .us, um, you can also email us, info at connectnaturalc.org. We have some, we can get, we can get one to you. Um, I think that covers it. Thank you all. Um, have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Take care. Mm -hmm.